Good morning and welcome to the Gospel of this morning. We're in the first letter of Peter and we are coming to the 20th part in our exposition. Well, last time we had a wonderful story. We heard about the birth of a church in Philippi as the result of persecution. There is always a testimony to be heard that gives us hope and hope is here to turn into reality for all of us. And I would like to read something from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 36 and from there onwards. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scorchings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword, of whom the world was not worthy. And these all having obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now Peter carries on in a similar tone of voice and let us read for our lesson today, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be for them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteousness scarcely be saved, or the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Well, the first subtitle then, For the time is come. God has a perfect timetable. For the affairs of men. There is a time for everything and it is not our own conducting or planning it. It is entirely of God. We saw it clearly in the letter to the Galatians. Well, chapter 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Everything that happens in our life is of God ordained and that in such a way that we are in the best position to find him. Our own timetable causes just delays and hardship because at all costs the Lord will have his way. Now the problem that arises is our appointed time of death and many will be lost because of their hardened heart. The worst that can happen is described in the first chapter of Romans, when God gives up on us. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Now this brings us to the next subtitle, that judgment must begin at the house of God. This is an utterance that should be kept alive during this whole dispensation. We, we read something in Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness. Now, the handbook for correction is God-inspired scripture in the hands of a mature eldership. Here we have our first obstacle, the lack of eldership. Modern pastors surround themselves with a group of yes-men that will go along with every whim of the headman. At the same time, we have a congregation of grown bearded men in nappies and milk bottles in their hand. Now, most fellowships are divided between cessationists and a few who want to continue in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The result is a spiritually dying church. We may hear some sermons with the words we should, but never actually how to do it and promoting spiritual growth. Now, when Paul wrote the first letter to the Corinthians and mentioned the gifts of the Holy Ghost, it was like all scripture. 
valid until heaven and earth shall pass away. To pick and choose what we like and reject, what does not suit us, comes out of the false kitchen. I, I would like to repeat the scripture in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These, now these are the men of Berea, were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And here it comes, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now the Bereans were judging Paul's preaching with scripture, not once, but daily. This concerns us very much. We do not nag at the preacher, but we ask questions when things are not scripturally understood. The congregation approaches the elders and the elders speak to the preacher or pastor. Now, the first question we have to ask is, what constitutes the house of God? Are we talking about what is generally known as Christendom? Or are we speaking of a born-again congregation? People who are doctrinally far removed from the pure doctrine of Christ are not addressed as the house of God. This includes all Christian cults like Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, New and Old Apostolic Churches, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox Churches, and most of the Anglicans, etc. We need to be careful also when we get to modern charismatic fellowships. They have become nothing more than wealth creators for some pastoral elite. We do not judge them, because the talk would be too enormous. But we warn true believers not to be taken with their flattery or condemnation of truth. Now, secondly, we have to separate doctrine from opinion. Doctrine is well defined in scripture and most evangelicals agree with each other. Opinion is often accompanied with an unteachable spirit. It has mostly to do with eschatology, unfulfilled prophecies, with, with different opinions on Israel, with millennial interpretations, with time interpretation, with conspiracy theories concerning natural disasters, plagues and earthquakes, etc. It all takes the attention away from Jesus. Now, Scripture points to our sinful nature, whereas opinion diverts our attention away from it. Now, judgment needs to be passed before the mirror, looking first and foremost at ourselves, and then we can start at the house of God. Okay, now if we begin at us, well, where we have a title for it, let us look at ourselves. Do, do I even know what I believe? Now, some questions would have to be answered, some, some easy to answer and some highlighting our ignorance. Am I? It's the question. Am I Catholic or Protestant? Uh, am I a Calvinist or Arminianist? Am I a historicist, futurist or a preterist? Am I a cessationist or continuist? Complementarian or egalitarian? Dispensationalist or do I believe in covenant theology or replacement theology? Do I believe in post or pre or premillennialism? Um, Trinitarian, Binitarian, Unitarian. Now, these are just a few examples where, di where we differ from one another and it can cause great rift doctrinally. As an example, we take point eight on how we define God. Each of the three views present another God. We cannot agree or make room for one another. In point three, we have a difference in one verse, for instance, even in the interpretation, one, two letter word, and the, it is he, the futurists say he is Antichrist, whereas the historicists say he is Jesus Christ. The same verse. We, we, we have such differences in the church and very few are even aware of it. Never questioning the preacher to explain. The New Testament epistles are addressing all these issues and we ignore them because of lack of commitment. Yes, secondly, where is our commitment? 
It has to do with applying our mind to become biblically minded and not culturally or historically. Judgment points heavily to the subject. Are we tolerant and basically against biblical command because it is not socially or culturally acceptable to the world we live in? Now, the biggest problems we face on this level is feminism and liberalism. And the preachers are so worried to say something against Eve and, 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 and treat it worse than racism or anti-Semitism. Thirdly, it is our outward behavior and presentation. We all know the scripture in verse 1 and 2 of Romans chapter 12 and are taken up with the latest fashion trends and gadgets. Our body fails to be the temple of the Holy Spirit because we have dedicated it to the flesh and its desires. Then concerning our soul, it looks even worse. What is the soulish component of man? It is our thought life, our emotions, our perceptions. In the, in the list of liquidation, or liquidity in Revelation chapter 18 verses 12 and 13. It begins with gold and silver and precious stones and it ends with the souls of men. When we have liquidated all that we possess from gold downward, we come to the second last possession that we have. It's our body. We can become slaves. The very last item we have for sale is our soul. Comparing it with what we call the soul, then it is mostly our mind, and most of today's people have already sold their soul to earn a living. It is our mind that takes the money or makes the money today. No more the sweat of our brow. Paul writes to the Thessalonians to work with their hands, it is perhaps to keep our mind or our soul on the things of God. God surely looks down and sees a bunch of cursed dodgers who have already their soul to Babylon. What a sad story we have to end with today. But let us consider these things. Let us look at ourselves and look at our fellowship and see if judgment really has to begin at the house of God. Till thus far today, God bless you. Until next time.